The Princess is by far the most popular and memorable legendary card in the entire history of Clash Royale. From her first appearance and rise in usage rates to creating a legendary deck archetype that's still very competitive even after 8 years, she has captivated the hearts of millions of players with her unparalleled skills and of course, her stunning looks. As an OG player, just looking at her hits me with nostalgia from the days when legendary cards were incredibly difficult to obtain. Ew. Oh yes! Yes! Fucking finally! Yes, guys, finally we have the damn princess. Oh my god, it's been forever. But very powerful in any deck, and when it felt amazing to have them. Most Clash Royale players today might not even know that there was once a free daily wooden chest with a chance of containing the princess or, you know, other legendaries. This is a feeling no one will ever forget. Seeing her fills me with positive memories of when Clash Royale was a brand new game and it makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. This warmth might be from nostalgia, or it might be because I'm burning from her flaming arrows shot from another yard. Yeah, we're gonna be going over the entire history of the princess and how she created the ultimate legacy, which still never fails. So, let's go back to 2016 and talk about Clash Royale for just a moment. It was a fresh new game, with no clan wars, no pass royale, no mega knight, no big chests, and as you know, no legendaries. The game only had 42 cards, categorized into common, rare, and epic. Clash Royale wasn't globally launched until March 2nd. Supercell was planning to add more cards to the game, including two new cards of a new rarity we all know today as Legendary. The first Legendary card added to Clash Royale was Our Dear Princess on February 29th, followed by the Ice Wizard. These cards became available to everyone after the game launched globally. As you might know and remember, Legendary cards were the strongest of all rarities by having the abilities and stats other rarities just couldn't have. For Ice Wizard, it was slowing down the enemy troops with his attacks. For Princess, a very, very long attack range, which today is still the longest out of all the ground troops. This is what made the princess a special card. She was, and is, a very good splash card that can attack the enemy princess tower without crossing the bridge, and if left alone, can three crown an ignorant enemy without any problems. You can now get the idea why so many people freaked out whenever they managed to unlock a legendary card from chests. It was very difficult and not to mention very expensive, as it wasn't even 100% guaranteed. Getting a legendary was only a small part of the battle. Leveling them up was a whole nother demon. It was very expensive, especially with the gold economy at that time. Every single level mattered, because that's what made your card stronger and better. If you somehow managed to level your princess to the max level, so level 6 at that time, your princess was tough enough to survive arrows. <laughs> yeah. Arrows. But there's something even more interesting about her. Do you know the story behind the princess and where she comes from? Well, from what we know today, the princess is the daughter of the Blue King. We found that out when Supercell dropped the royal family tree lore. But it doesn't make too much sense. See, the Blue King has a daughter, while also having the other two princesses in the towers beside him. The lore has been, and still is, very inconsistent, but the most realistic way to think about this is that the Blue King just has three daughters. But why is the third princess a troop and not a princess tower? Well, yeah, before we answer that question, how about you scroll down and click that like in the juicy red subscribe button. It's free, and you know you can always change your mind. <clears throat> now. Back to the princess lore. So while we might not have a definitive answer, there's a clash o episode called Archer Departure. So in this episode, we learn that the ground princess's name is Ellie. This may not be her official name, but that's what the clash o calls her. Ellie aspires to become a tower princess, but often feels overlooked by the Blue King, especially when characters like the Magic Archer start drawing more attention on the Blue Team. Despite her great archery skills, the King's interest remains with the Magic Archer, which frustrates Ellie and she wants to get revenge on the Magic Archer. Determined to confront the Magic Archer, Ellie tracks him down for a so-called talk, but accidentally traps herself and others inside. She ends up staying with the Magic Archer and other groups in his unusual training regimen, where she learns valuable lessons about teamwork. When she returns to the arena and the battle begins, the Magic Archer betrays the blue team and joins the red side. Fortunately, Ellie manages to defeat him and win the game. With that, the king finally notices Ellie and is very impressed. He offers her a spot in the Princess Towers, however, Ellie turns it down after realizing, thanks to the magic archer, that being side by side with her team is better than being alone in a tower. 
And this is how we now have the princess as a troop card, according to the Clasherama episode at least. It's also known that the princess and prince are in love, as seen from another Clasherama episode. Which princess though, that's uh, well, no need to get deep with the game's lore, so let's just say they're love birds who fell in love at first sight despite being different in quite literally every way. And the prince is definitely very loyal to the princess. Definitely. The princess was, and still kind of is, a very versatile card that could be used in almost every deck back then. Defensively, the princess was mostly placed behind the king tower to build the push. It didn't matter which side she went on because her massive range allowed her to target enemy troops from any side. This immense range made her a great support card for most pushes, as she could kill swarm cards that would try to stop your push. For example, let me introduce you to the Hog Princess Cycle deck. There were a lot of variations, but the one I'd like to show you is this one. Your main win condition was Hog Rider, of course, since he was very strong back then, while the cheap goblin and skeleton cards helped maintain your cycle. There was also a mini P.E.K.K.A., which was essential at that time because of the very strong royal giant, and the princess played one, if not the most important role, defending and supporting your Hog Rider by killing enemy swarm cards. She was effective, bringing a huge value, and the deck was very deadly, becoming very popular in a short span of time for a long time. There was also a variation of this deck with the Ice Golem which added great support for the Hog Rider to push even harder, as the Ice Golem soaked up damage. Offensively, the princess proved to be remarkably effective. When played correctly, the opponent was forced to play by your rules. The princess was a great chip damage card, dealing over 200 hit points. Throughout the entire game, you could continuously send the princess to the bridge to chip away at the enemy tower. This strategy forced the opponent to respond to the princess, spending elixir. You could preserve the princess and keep chipping away at the tower, which was always a superior option. If your opponent didn't react to her, then you basically had the tower. We're talking about a card that can three crown you if ignored without getting hit once. While she was chipping away at the tower, you could cycle your deck and give you a chance to place another princess for defense. People also started coming up with optimal princess placements for attacking cards. For example, if Mega Minion was in the outer edge, princess was placed in the middle to optimally damage it without taking tower or princess damage. If a Lava Hound was used, you'd wait for it to lock onto the princess tower and then place her right behind your king, etc. and etc. These placements were also kind of risky, since if the opponent had a good spell, they'd get insane value too by killing your princess and taking a few hundred hit points off your princess tower. She synergized with a lot of cards over her history. She had beautiful synergies with Miner, placing a Miner in front of her or to the side of the tower allowed the princess's splash to cover him. It's basically a cheaper Miner poison but with more overall damage. She synergized well with Fire Spirits, yep, yeah, Fire Spirits, there were three of them when they were added instead of just a crappy one like they are today. She synergized extremely extremely well with any spell bait cards, as we'll see soon. The Hog and the Ice Golem, along with Tesla and many other cards. Thus showing everybody that the princess was not only a great at defense, but support and offense as well. So why wouldn't you use it? It's a cheap splash card that could do more than simple arrows. And well, also it's a legendary card, so everyone who got it would use it all the time. Obviously. Princess, after just a few days and weeks after her release, managed to go up to 39% usage rate in February and 51% in March, going from a great card to an amazingly great card due to, once again, long range and lack of counters. To stop this quick growth, Supercell decided to give the card a little nerf. On the 23rd of March, the princess received a 10% decrease to her HP. This made it so that the princess could be taken out by tournament standard arrows. But this little change didn't affect her usage negatively. Also because she was a new legendary card everyone liked and was talking about, people still played her. And for April, the usage rate was already 65%, beating the arrows usage and becoming the number one card in the entire game. Princess was able to achieve this high of a usage rate due to her not having hard counters at all. But because she was becoming more and more used, people started using minions and also the mini P.E.K.K.A. to keep her in check. And it did work to some degree. And her usage rate lowered down to 43% for May. Well, why not the log? Well, because the log didn't exist back then. Duh. Also, fun fact, a level 6 princess did not die to arrows, and some players were mad. 
about this. May was also when Supercell decided to decrease the legendary card cap from 6 to 5, and apparently Princess's range was bugged out, allowing her range to be 9.5 tiles. 9.5. So they also fixed this bug in May. Other popular decks at that time included Giant Balloon Control, Expo Siege, Three Musketeer Beatdown, but the Hog Princess Cycle was one of the best decks at that time. The Princess was also frequently seen in control decks, quite a bunch of them, to be frank. But the archetype she fit and was absolutely essential in was, you guessed it, the legendary Logbait. Logbait isn't like any other archetype of today. In fact, it's a legacy that still exists today from 2016 after Supercell introduced the Log card. So, to explain this deck, we'll also have to learn the history of Logbait along with the Princess. Why? Well, because the princess is literally the reason why this archetype was created. So, how did the princess influence the log bait, you might ask? Before we discuss that, let's first ask why Supercell created the log, and what was the reason for the card? One of your answers may be that they just wanted the game to be more diverse spell-wise, so it would make a great addition to the game. But the real answer was princess. At that time, there was only one powerful spell which was in every single deck, quite literally every one, and it was Zap. The Zap was extremely popular and was always the choice between the existing spells at that time, which were two, Fireball and Arrows. It was able to one-shot skeletons, minions, goblins, every small card while stunning them in place. Inferno Tower, Sparky, Skeleton Army were useless and killed off entirely. Goblin Barrel 2, which is a card we even use today and was one of the essential parts of a new upcoming archetype, but it was useless against Zap. That's because it originally cost 4 elixir, giving you a negative 2 elixir trade. This was always a massive value for the Zap player. It was the most must-have card the game had ever seen, but it could not counter the most popular troop at the time. Princess. So Supercell had two issues. One, the Zap was very powerful and the most used spell, killing off the other existing spells and also the cards it countered. And Princess was the most powerful troop card. So to counter her and also compete with the Zap, on July 4th of 2016, the Log was introduced. But it didn't go how Supercell planned it to. Yeah, it became the hard counter to the Princess and was also the must-have for only that reason. So as you could tell, it couldn't compete with Zap. It was a very crappy card. It was slow, couldn't knock back many troops. Zap was just the superior option. It did everything the log was designed to do, but 10 times better. It was instant, faster, and more reliable. Zap's usage rate for the top 100 ladder was 98%. Yeah, that's the correct number. And the log had a 0%. It just sucked. The only pro it had was just being able to one-shot our stunning princess. Haha! <laughs> That's it. So, for July, her usage rate was 52%. It dropped a teeny bit after the log was introduced, so no big deal. And it was able to achieve 60% again in August. Because the log was used by ghost people, the princess players weren't afraid to use her at all. People sensed a nerf for a few months after her existence in Clash Royale, and Supercell decided to step in and nerf her on August 24th. The princess got her splash radius nerfed from 2.5 tiles to 2. To put this into perspective, her splash damage went from that of a fireball to that of a rocket. And this was a big change. A very big change. She wasn't able to hit fast-moving troops like goblins anymore, which made her sort of useless against those encounters. They kept her long range to make up for the radius, but that was nothing. Some argued it was the right thing to do, but some also argued it was very, well, heavy-handed. And I'm siding with the opposite side. It was a little overkill. This led to many interactions and pushes that were no longer possible due to the nerf. Her usage rate dropped to 29% overnight after the nerf was applied, and in a few days it fell to 17%, which was a significant decline. 
This raises the question, what else could they have done to balance out the princess? One option could have been to buff her counters, and they eventually did buff the log in the near future, which we will discuss shortly. Another option was to adjust her stats, which they did just five days after the nerf. Some impressive speed, especially for the time. The developers increased her projectile speed from 400 to 450. In simple terms, this allowed her to hit very fast targets, the fast-moving type on foot in the game. This adjustment was just great because it enabled her to bounce back from her nerf. Although restoring the old big radius would have been sufficient, the increased projectile speed was still a nice touch. Of course, the usage rate began to rise again. It reached 21% in September and shot up to 51% in October. During this time, she was frequently seen in Hog and Minor Control decks. I also forgot to mention a little bug the princess had when paired with the Ice Golem. For some reason, if your princess was with your Ice Golem and the Ice Golem died to arrows, his Death Nova would make the princess invincible for that moment. This was a clutch bug for the princess, but it was patched soon after without any mention of it. Uh, who knows what kind of changes Supercell makes behind the scenes? We may never know. Even though the princess became popular again in October, it was also the time when Golem Beatdown became meta. Ice Golem 2 became the best card in the game at around this time. Uh, consequently, princess decks fell off entirely since they were completely unusable against Golems. Her usage rate plummeted to 8% and remained around 7% for the rest of the year. How about that splash damage? Was it not useful? Well, not at all for this case. Arrows managed to do a better job at it, but don't worry, things were just getting started. Returning to our log bait history, the log was added, but it initially paled in comparison to Zap. So Supercell made the right move by nerfing Zap and buffing the log to promote diversity in spells and balance the game. The buffed log was superior to today's log in every way. It dealt more damage, had more range, and provided greater pushback. Despite all this, the Zap still remained the superior option with a 77% usage rate. The Log managed to climb to 29% usage, and these stats are all from January of 2017. In the same month, the Dart Goblin was added. It could survive a Zap, but died to the Log, giving the Log even more of a purpose. Players compared the Dart Goblin to the Princess, with opinions split on which was better depending on the context. The Princess was always used for long-ranged, consistent attacks without getting shot by the Princess Tower, while the Dart Goblin was a quick sniping card that could deal more damage, but died to the Princess Tower. The Princess remained the superior option for most players due to her longer range. However, the Dart Goblin was sometimes used in decks that also included the Princess, as a free-to-play variant for players who didn't spend money on the game, didn't get lucky with free wooden chests, or just didn't have the Princess. Although the Dark Goblin's damage wasn't as close to the Princess's, it still worked about 40% of the time. Eh, probably. His usage rate sucked and was at 2% while the Princess hit rock bottom with a 3% usage rate. Yikes. There was also Magic Archer in 2018 that people compared the Princess to, but they just weren't the same. The three served different purposes. I'll read you one quote from a Reddit post which has the complete princess guide written for 2018. <clears throat> quote, the princess is the best of the three for AoE and baiting spells, as well as being one of the best for defense. The Dark Goblin is the best for sniping buildings, as he has the highest DPS of the three, as well as quickly melting mini tanks or glass cannons. The Magic Archer is the best for taking down pushes and shooting the tower with his piercing arrow. The princess is unique because unlike Magic Archer and Dark Goblin, although both power creeper in the sense that both are better for taking out minions, which is supposed to be her job, the princess is the only one that demands a response. But with princess, it's super difficult to kite her, because she locks on almost instantly, within two steps of deploying. With Hog and Mini P.E.K.K.A., you have time to react. And that's the end of the quote. So there you have it. The entire debate ended. After a few weeks, Princess started to gain more popularity at the end of January when Ice Golem was hit with the hardest nerf ever. Spells 2 were nerfed, Supercell also in the same month nerfed the Zap's damage by 6%, which was a massive change. It couldn't one-shot goblins anymore, and people started ditching Zap, which caused the rise of the goblin cards, especially the goblin barrel. And the princess, well, she managed to climb to a respectable 22% in the same month. And because Zap no longer one-shot goblins, the log shot up in popularity by a lot, beating the Zap 
gap in usage rates. In February, the princess managed to stay at a decent 14% because, of course, people started using Log more and more. Despite all of this, the princess decks we mentioned earlier, like the Minor Control and Hog, were still flowing inside the game, especially in the mid ladder. But another change would happen that would make this archetype mainstream inside the game. The Goblin Gang. Essentially, this was just two cards smushed together. But one elixir cheaper, and the Zap couldn't one-shot it, making the Log even more popular, therefore popularizing and creating the ultimate log bait. So, it's February 26th of 2017, and a very popular Clash YouTuber, Orange Juice, uploads a video titled Goblin Barrel Log Bait Deck, which was the first ever log bait deck that was made. The deck was simple, yet it proved to be a very high skill if played perfectly. To put it simply, this deck was a masterpiece. The idea and strategy were to use multiple cards that were countered by Log. So Goblin Barrel, Goblin Gang, and of course, our stunning lady, the Princess. Make the enemy Log one of them. Once the Log was successfully baited out, use the other cards for chip damage. In this case, you baited out the Log with the Princess or the Goblin Gang, and Goblin Barrel to the enemy Princess Tower, which was the main win condition. And bam! <laughs> You just won the game. If your opponent decided not to log the princess or the goblin gang and instead log the barrel, you'd still get some insane damage from the two. This is where you also saw the dark goblin together with the princess, which was great at defending her while she chipped away at the tower. But there was also one variation with the rocket, which was equally as deadly if not more. Once you got the enemy princess tower down to rocket damage range, you had the entire game in your bag. After OJ's video dropped, the log bait immediately boosted the popularity of the princess, getting her back on high numbers, and by the end of February and middle of March, her usage rate was at 36% in the top 200 players. It should also be noted that the log had a placement bug and also received a nerf, but that didn't stop it from being the best card in the game, maintaining a robust 57% usage in the top 200 ladder plays. Many variants were created during this time. One notable variant was the minor bait deck, which managed to win eight grand challenges in a row, with five of them being 12-0 victories. That's pretty dang impressive. No arguing that. The log bait archetype quickly became the number one deck in the entire game. Supercell had to intervene somehow, so they buffed the bats, making Zap necessary again, which in turn dropped the log's usage. However, the princess could easily eliminate bats as if they were nothing. Players began switching the Inferno Tower with Tornado due to its versatility. Tesla also received the rework, making it a viable card in the meta and probably the best building for log bait. The log bait archetype remained popular and number one in Clash Royale for three months straight, with no fluctuations. In August and September, the princess managed to maintain a 22% usage rate in the top 100 ladder plays, which is still very impressive. However, Supercell was not happy about one deck dominating the entire game, so they started planning to balance the game better. In December, they decided to nerf several cards, Goblin Gang, Goblin Barrel, Log, Inferno Tower, Knight, and Rocket. Despite this nerf, the deck still held strong at second place in the game. Then Supercell released a new card, the Royal Ghost, which quickly became a meta-defining card and took the number one spot in the game. The two princes also received buffs, especially the Dark Prince, which completely killed the Goblin cards, while the Knight was nerfed, ultimately dethroning the log bait and dropping to the 10th place in the entire game. During this time, Princess had a 19% usage rate in top 200 ladder plays. This was a hard time for our Princess and, well, log bait as a whole. People were starting to debate whether she was still worth it or not, needless of the meta. Log bait completely disappeared throughout 2018, with the Princess maintaining a small 5-15% usage in the top 200 plays, one of the lowest points she had reached since her introduction. I mean, just think about it. How many cards have ended up in the same fate as the Princess? While they were once number one in the game, dominating and being meta, and one year later, they're on the bottom of the usage rates. And I mean, it's not anyone's fault, nor is anyone faulting anyone. Supercell does what they think they need to do to keep the game balanced 
balanced and enjoyable for everyone. There's also the massive difference in top ladder and mid ladder players, so balancing out cards is very difficult considering they have to take into account two completely different metas and make them work everywhere. So kudos to Supercell, thanks for balancing the game and preventing it from being unplayable. Still, you're still a big money bag. My disappointment aside, Supercell also buffed Valkyrie's first attack speed from 0.2 seconds to 0.0, making it instant, effectively killing the Goblin Barrel. Off-meta logbait decks still existed in the mid-ladder and were manageable if you weren't up against the meta deck. Even when facing meta decks, it was possible to win. Another card added to classic logbait was the Rascals. The Rascal Boy proved to be an effective tank for the Rascal Girls who dealt decent damage to attacking cards like the Dark Prince, Prince, and Royal Ghost. The Goblin Gang remained because it was effective against the normal Prince. Inferno Tower was replaced by the Inferno Dragon in this variation, and Valkyrie was included as well because she was incredibly strong after that attack speed buff. If played right, it was possible to beat Double Prince Golem beatdown decks. This was a time when players needed to think a lot harder about their matchups. This deck required high skill and strategic thinking. The main strategy was to outcycle the opponent while dealing chip damage to the towers, resulting in beautifully executed plays. Another variation of the Hog Princess cycle was created with the Tornado, Bats, and Ice Wizard, still packing a punch like in 2016. The idea was to outcycle the opponent while dealing chip damage and set sending out the Hog Rider for significant hits. As expected, the Royal Ghost eventually received a nerf, allowing other cards to rise again. A new deck, the Minor Poison Cycle, was also created with log bait elements, Princess and Goblin Gang. Bats were sometimes used as zap bait, and many players didn't expect these decks to reappear in the meta, but it was both surprising and amazing. Yet this was only the beginning of the log bait archetype. As the game became more and more legendary friendly, players could upgrade their princess more easily. Why? Well, because she could survive the log if her level was high enough. This was crucial as the log was released, and my apologies for not mentioning this earlier. There's so many little details in log bait that it's hard to keep track of everything. If your princess or dark goblin were two levels above the log, they could survive it since 2016 and 2017. Upgrading your princess in the log bait and using her to bait out the log would leave her severely wounded, but alive to shoot one or more arrows. The downside was that many people also upgraded their log because it was the best spell in the game, so it just made sense to do it but it's good to know regardless. These variations were still seen floating around from time to time at the end of 2018 and in 2019, with also new ones getting created. These decks, like the previous ones mentioned, required high skill to win against the hard meta decks. In January of 2019, her usage rate was recorded at 9%, with a 50% win rate, as she maintained these stats almost the whole year, plus or minus maybe 3-5% in the top ladder. However, in May's balance change, Supercell increased her projectile speed from 450 to 600, making her arrows travel faster. That faster projectile speed made the princess even more effective against fast-moving targets, making her a stronger counter against various decks at that time. As a result, the princess's usage rate increased as players found her more viable in different strategies. The log bait decks, which relied on baiting out defensive cards, like the log, had to adapt to the improved princess's faster arrows. This led to changes in deck compositions and strategies, but as far as interactions go, nothing big really changed. One could also say that the meta became more balanced as the princess became a more competitive card, reducing the dominance of certain decks and allowing for a wider variety of viable strategies. As for decks, we got a new variation of the Hog Princess Cycle deck which still required a lot of skill to play and master. The faster cycle not only made the Hog more spammable, but obviously the princess too, chipping away to her heart's content as much as she wanted. Until she got logged. Gotcha. We also saw a new Minor Poison deck, which was better than in the past, and it also had the Barbarian Barrel, which was also thriving at that time and competing with the Log. It was able to one-shot the Princess while also spawning a single Barbarian to stop a push for a moment and deal a hit or two 
at a tower. Only one card disappeared from Princess's decks, and it was Tornado. The Tornado was reworked and so it no longer really fit the deck anymore, its place was taken back by the Inferno Tower, as you saw from the Minor Poison deck I showed you just a minute ago. But interestingly, in 2020, the meta would change and it boosted the popularity of the Logbait decks once again. The already existing decks saw some decent usage, one of the best ones being the classic Logbait with Goblin Gang and Princess, but also with Tesla, which was very powerful back then. Hog Cycle decks began to see a rise again. But arguably, the number one princess and bait deck at that time was the princess bait deck that included the Royal Hogs. Royal Hogs at that time were very decent and powerful. The card was like a sleeper card, which didn't seem to be good, but they were very powerful with a good deck, and so they found the place inside the princess's bait deck. Later on, another card was added to Log Bait, the Skeleton Barrel. Skeleton Barrel acted like another bait card added next to the Goblin Barrel, Goblin Gang, and Princess. And I don't think I need to explain why this card in this deck was so good. Skeleton Barrel made Log Bait very popular yet again. And if they played correctly, it was even able to beat Gollum Beatdown. I know, insane, but not impossible. In January and February, the usage rates for Princess were about 7 10% in top ladder, which is a very healthy state. But in February, another card would be added that would compete with our Princess, the Firecracker. When the Firecracker was released, she was incredibly overpowered. Her recoil was much bigger, allowing her to counter the bowler without taking a hit and effortlessly kite the P.E.K.K.A. across the arena. Many players started switching to the Firecracker because of her broken knockback, which promoted more defensive plays while also being able to kill swarms and have more chances to survive with troops than the Princess. The main argument was, Princess is used only in log bait decks, and Firecracker, well, she can be used elsewhere. Which is a fair point. The Princess was considered the worst legendary card outside of Logbait decks. Although the Princess had a lot of value on her own, she was best in Logbait, while the Firecracker seemed to work everywhere else. Despite Firecracker being considered just better than the Princess, Princess still managed to maintain a steady usage rate of 7 to 10%, just like before. They were two very different cards with very different rules. The Princess's massive range was something that many couldn't give up, despite Firecracker. Firecracker's broken knockback. Also, the Firecracker's attacks sometimes activated the enemy King Tower, which was annoying for the user. That is not something you want to happen to you, so the Princess was better in that way too. Take that, Firecracker. Logbait continued to be a great deck, averaging between 6-10% usage for the rest of the year. The popular decks at this time were Logbait Variants, Princess Baits, Hog Cycles, and the same decks that had been trending in the game since 2016. However, there was a card rework that brought devastation to Logbait, and some could say it was the end. In June, Supercell decided to rework Fire Spirits into a single Fire Spirit. The Fire Spirits provided too much value, greater than the Fireball for too less elixir. To make it still viable, they buffed its range and made it one elixir, which was overkill for logbait decks. It could entirely counter the Goblin Gang in the Goblin Barrel without taking a single hit. You didn't even have to think about placing the Fire Spirit in the right place because its big range would hit all three anyway. Because it was just one elixir, it was seen in many, many decks. Logbait failed to succeed during this time and its usage rate dropped significantly. The Princess's usage in June dropped to 5%, and it presumably could have reached 3% in July. She was considered the worst legendary card ever in the entire game, marking the worst era for our beloved Princess and for log bait. Despite this, the princess kept being used for her massive range. Many players kept her alive from enemy troops just to score extra chip damage, which was always worth it. Although she was the worst legendary card and the hardest to play in the meta, she still required high skill to play. This is where I'd like to introduce you to Yusuf. Yusuf was considered the world's best hog princess player of all time, and that title wasn't just for show. The Hog Princess deck always required high skill to play and win, and it was hard to play the princess in this meta. He proved that keeping the princess alive during matches was very game-changing. He always managed to win grand challenge after grand challenge and pushed for the top in the ladder. However, a deck would soon take over Clash Royale entirely and include our little princess the Royal Ghost deck. The reason this deck took over Clash Royale was pretty simple. It was very powerful, 
And it was used by Muhammad Light, who's the best player in Clash Royale, even today. Royal Ghost was very decent and powerful at that time, so he was pretty much meta. There was also the new Fire Spirit, and seeing the princess in that deck was unexpected for many people, but hey, she was there. This deck also faced Morton, one of the best players of Clash Royale, and he lost to it, making Muhammad Light and his deck superior. Thankfully, in September, the Fire Spirit's damage radius was nerfed back down, making the Goblin Barrow viable again and giving Logbait a chance to thrive. However, the Snowball was buffed, allowing it to knock back troops even further, which completely countered the Goblin Barrel. In 2021, champions were added to the game, reshaping the meta, but despite this, the Princess remained useful, especially against Swarms and the Skeleton King's Skeletons. Her usage in December was still decent, reaching 10%, which was impressive given the challenging meta, but her win rates were considered low. I mean, it was below 50, and it only started to decline. And with her still not dying, neither was Logbait, despite the harsh updates. And I think that this is the perfect time to talk about another player who was still considered to be the best Logbait player in the entire game, Riley. Riley started his YouTube journey in May of 2021, and his skills caught many players' attention, including mine. He claimed top spots a lot of times with just Logbait. He finished 33rd in the world with Logbait in November of 2021. In May of 2022, he finished 12th in the world with the Mighty Miner variant. Eventually, he kept going up and up and up, becoming the 4th in the world, top 3, and this year, he won the number 1 spot in the world. And to top it off, he qualified for the 2024 World Finals, which is big news for him. I recommend checking out his channel if you want to learn more about Logbait. Uh, links down in the description. Now, in 2022, Phoenix and Monk were added, and they completely ducked over the meta with an F. So while it's hard to really track how Logbait was doing, it's safe to say that it didn't live during this time. In December, the Rage spell was able to do splash damage, and it was able to one-shot goblins, causing more problems for Logbait, but it was quickly changed so it wouldn't. What's more interesting is that the Mighty Miner would find his way into the Logbait archetype because he got buffed, and he was the first ever champion seen in Logbait, and he synergized extremely well. But his stay would not be long, because he got emergency nerfed almost immediately. Princess was slowly dying and it was very noticeable. Her usage rate remained at a consistent 7% for the entire year, with her win rates below 40%, which was very bad for a legendary card. The things she did were impressive in 2016 and very useful, but in 2022, common cards and champions with new abilities made her less relevant. How could she even be considered the greatest legendary when she was clearly falling off in 2022? The problem wasn't that the card was bad. The problem was the meta. The new cards were too strong, creating powerful decks that older cards, including the princess, just couldn't compete with. Her usage rate and win rates kept declining over time. In July, she managed to jump down to 2% usage. So what could Supercell do? Enter Evolutions. Uh, in August, new card evolutions were announced to make common and old cards stronger and more used in modern Clash Royale. And it kind of worked. The best card for Logbait was the Evo Knight, who was extremely strong for a long time. His massive health allowed him to tank a lot of damage for the princess while clearing through and killing enemy troops and dealing multiple hits to the tower, with the princess chipping away from the bridge. This brought the glory back to Logbait for a while. And things would have been going better for the princess and Logbait if not for the pure annoyance of the little prince. Another reason to make me want to punch him in the face even harder. For December, her usage rate was 3% with a 35% win rate, which I don't think I have to tell you is extremely low. Then something big would also happen towards the end of 2023 that would change the game forever. So you know how Clash Royale matches were always having a king and two princesses defending? Well, now you can swap those princesses out for other troops, which was a very unexpected update. The first ever tower troop was the princess, obviously, with the cannoneer coming next and competing with her. He was introduced as the new tower troop in January of 2024, replacing the tower princess. The cannoneer brought a unique dynamic to the game with his powerful cannon attacks, instead of just regular arrows. Also a fun lore drop, the cannoneer is the cousin 
of the Red King, which is officially proved by the game devs with the royal family tree. Now for the question, which tower troops were better? Well, it kinda depends. The Princess Tower is the same as she was in the entire game's history, Cannoneer does more damage per shot just with a longer interval between shots, objectively there were answers but it mostly depends on the meta which tower troop was better. But Cannoneer didn't do much to long bait. It was another tower troop, the Dagger Duchess, that would effectively kill the log bait almost instantly. The Dagger Duchess was released on April 1st, and she was the most powerful tower troop bar none. Her usage rate skyrocketed to 80% in a few days. Part of the reason as to why is because she was released for free, and she was the number one card in the game. The Princess Tower troop fell down to 18% usage rate with horrible win rates. Dagger Duchess was able to kill the Goblin Barrel and other swarm cards instantly due to her fast attack speed, so log bait was completely useless with her in the meta. But the Duchess wasn't able to kill our princess because of her long range, so her popularity was skyrocketing. In May, she was finally able to go above two digits again and reached 15% usage rate with a 51% win rate, which was a massive change. Muhammad Light crafted a deck with literally no win condition, yet it was regarded as the best deck of its time. This crazy combination included the princess, Evo Skellies, Little Prince, Rocket, Evo Tesla, and solid defensive cards like the Knight and Electro Spirit. Thanks to the princess and the rocket, it was effortless to chip away at the opponent's tower, effectively functioning as win conditions. With Evo Skellies, Evo Tesla, the Little Prince, and the Knight for defense, it was a breeze to hold off attacks. It's no surprise that Muhammad Light has been dominating with this very deck archetype. Soon enough, the nerf hammer struck the Dagger Duchess, causing her usage rate to plummet. Finally. However, this shift had a ripple effect, causing the princess to lose some of her spotlight as she was no longer the top choice among the elite players. In June, another change would be made. The Goblin Barrel Evolution Revolution. This evolution made it so that there were two barrels thrown instead of one. And only one of them is real. The second is a decoy. This made predicting the barrel much harder for the enemy, and it's safe to say that it brought back log bait decks in the meta, which is still popular to this day. As of today's stats in October, the princess is seen with usage rates of 8% with a 50% win rate, which is a very healthy state for a card. One of the best decks today are still princess and log bait decks. All of them are containing the Evo Goblin Barrel and Goblin Gang. So it's safe to say that the log bait is still alive and well, even for today's meta, and it's not going anywhere any time soon. But what do you think? Do you think the princess needs a change or a buff or maybe an evolution idea? Well, there's a lot of those floating around in the Clash Royale world. One very popular princess concept is the Dark Princess. And if you ask me, it makes sense. We got a prince and a dark prince, so why not a dark princess? For now, we have two variants. First is a dark princess troop carrying a shield and a sword instead of the bow. I know it's really different from the princess, but it's another card. She could have a tough shield that prevents 75% of all damage she receives, but it can't be used while she attacks. After her shield breaks though, she gets very angry and gets her movement and attacks boosted. All of this for 5 elixir if you ask me. That sounds like a very unique and great idea for the game. Now for the second variant, a dark princess that instead of shooting many arrows, shoots one arrow that strikes the ground and creates an earthquake that deals bonus damage to buildings. This idea is also unique and sounds great, but it would be very hard to balance her out in the real game. Needless to say, this is still a very good concept idea. The princess is the heart and soul of Long Bait, captivating players since 2016. She's the reason so many can't go a day without her, and for that alone, she stands as the greatest legendary in Clash Royale. Past, present, and likely forever. With that in mind, I've got an exciting video lined up for you next. Dive into the history of the most annoying and broken champion ever introduced, the Little Prince. His story is nothing short of extraordinary, and I can't wait to share it with you.